Okay, so now we have some time in case you want to discuss something, questions, answer. At least I've tried. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. about semantics, I was wondering uh, if there were some approaches that uh, where you could incorporate some information, you know, uh, about the score, for instance, it has only one voice or two voices, or for instance, also the metric constraint on the content of a measure. So uh, I have seen that there are like interactive approaches, but uh, do some models could take into account those uh, information to guide the recognition? Yes. So, uh, from the things that we've seen, the interactive approach using model constraints oh, yes. allows the user to control exactly this. So, do we care about, uh, you know, can we say there is only one voice? Or can we say that it has to fit within the measures? Uh, historically, people have used especially metrical constraints to kind of perform a sanity check on the output. Uh, all the commercial tools use this kind of constraints to suggest which parts of the recognition output need some of your attention. But uh, so far I haven't, I'm not really aware of pushing these, con of anyone pushing these constraints inside a machine learning system. Yeah. But, I, I, but, but it's something you can definitely think about. It's you have like multiple hypotheses, and then you kind of can rule out some of them. But, yeah. Possibly Aerospace does something like this because it has the, the math behind it and the HLMs they can incorporate this naturally. Yeah, but it, mm -hmm. well, you know, there's your next is your paper. <laughs> Um, can I ask what is the um, typical expectation from the digital musicology to it, or uh, to recognition? Um, yeah, I have a nice story to tell in the last music calling conference. Um, one guy from, I'm sorry to say, I don't remember from where, but from some library. He approached me and he said, oh, you're working in OMR? I said, yes. He said, so OMR doesn't work at all. I said, how is that? He said, yes, I have this uh, 17th century manuscript. I tried Photoscore and it did not work. So I said, yeah, <laughs> that would have been a great surprise if it had one. So I guess what I said, I mean, well, commercial tools are designed for musicians having printed music scores mostly in ideal conditions like yeah my conductor gave me this I want to include it in my repository or so but if you're a librarian or musicologist and you're studying like old music you need to develop your own your own OMR system or at least use one of the existing models with specific ground truth data that you create for your own manuscript so a lot of people that have uh, talked about this, they will la they will love to, but they don't want to spend any time in creating ground truth. So then, I mean, this is not magic. You can you need to spend some resources if you want to use OMR. So I think some people in the musicological field or the librarians field are not really um, connected to what OMR needs to be uh, successful. This is one of the points of organizing worms to bring together the library community with OMR researchers to manage expectations. Thank you. Um, in what I understood, it seemed to me like uh, one of the kind of preprocessing steps that was commonly used was to separate the text surrounding the steps and deal with it in a, a part. 
And I was wondering if extracting semantic annotation from this text could, would fall in the OMR field. For example, tempo annotation. You would have a text saying, for a quarter, a quarter uh, equals uh, mm -hmm. four, or, or even um, interpretation indication. And that you and then would would it fall in the OMR, or is it something that you consider apart? <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of a gray area. Uh, you are right that this is music relevant information that should be disintegrated from the score. Uh, but it's not like that's the biggest problem that we have right now. Uh, the Muslim of Gospel dataset actually annotates the types of text. I won't promise it's like always 100% consistent, but tempo annotations, dynamic markings, and other texts is selected, so you're welcome to try. Are you talking about lyrics or just this kind of letters? Uh, more, because uh, one of the objectives you mentioned for doing OMR was to give another rendition, for example. Mm -hmm. So that would be the kind of information that would really be relevant with respect to that. That's why I thought. So I would definitely consider it to be OMR actually kind of a subset. Because you would like, you know, ideally you would like to recover all the information that's in the score. And if you're just interested in parts of it, you can actually, with those machine learning approaches, formulate the task in a simpler way. And we've done this for, for some other scores that actually are structurally simpler. And then you can solve this already probably quite well with, with the tools that are available right now. It was the same question already, like, uh, and I didn't attend the whole lecture, so I'm not sure if you mentioned it already. So is there some tools for annotating the, the uh, for the OM, OMR, OMR? And the mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, there is the workflow from the Simsa project which is online, and this has a pixel.js editor for document layout analysis, and then there is the interactive symbol classifier. Uh, the other tool is the Muski marker app, where you can create uh, ground truths for symbol detection and the music notation graph. Um, I think this is more like a subject subjective question, I, and I do not really want to start a claim more. But um, what and when you do research, there, what do you have like which file formats do you use, or do you know, or what um, is least painful to use? Because I didn't really have good experience um, mm -hmm. uh, playing around with music XML. <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any intermediate file format that you use, or um, something that's easy to parse and evaluate? Well, it depends on how you're going to approach the OMR. We have explained here there are a lot of ways of approaching OMR, so depending on your choice, you may want some formats or others. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to add something. I can add that whenever you do some OMR, strive for the simplest possible format. <laughs> Ideally, because like, that's something you can actually work with. Um, Music XML has a lot of intricacies, as we've seen before. Um, so it does have one big advantage. It can be opened by many applications. Therefore, having like a big you know, advantage in that regard. And, and otherwise, I can just add that depending on your application, you should use an appropriate format. There are basically tools, and you should always get the right tool for the job that you have at hand. Actually, this is a good time to say something which we forgot to say. Uh, there is also the humdrum formats like Star Star Karen, which is a nice semantic encoding annotation. It also has a bunch of tools available. Uh, that might be of interest as one of these simple and efficient mm -hmm. formats with which you can do things. It's definitely more appropriate than MIDI, I would say, for uh, for working with music scores. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
some tech to really solve that much more. Uh, do you know if there have been attempts to augment the recognition with audio as well, recordings of the piece that you're trying to recognize? Well, we have here, we have, go. <laughs> Matthias, do you want to take this one? <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we've tried, and the MSMD data set allows you to do this. Uh, so far, we just haven't found the right model for this. It seems that it should work together, but uh, it's not exactly obvious how to combine this information, especially if you don't want to have both of these modalities available at runtime. If you if you're just have, for instance, just one and want to train it regularize it using the score image for audio transcription and vice versa. So this is a, again, this is a nice paper, you know, waiting to be written. The resources are all there. Go ahead. You mentioned libraries as an end-to-end solution it's open source. My question is, are the people or the community from Audiverse um, active in the recent research of OMR? Or, um, yes. So the thing is, um, it's been mainly developed by Harvey Bito, I think. Um, I'm not sure if I pronounced him correctly. He's been working on this in his spare time for quite some while, I think for over almost 10 years probably. Um, and they are now in a research collaboration with um, the Zurich Hochschule of Applied Science. So the research of Lukas Tugener and his colleagues is kind of targeted towards making our device more stable and, and better usable. So there is some sort of uh, collaboration. Unfortunately, he's not here or wasn't with attending WARMS, but we definitely invited him. So I think this is also something like trying to get people of the community together. So, yeah. Uh, another of those questions, uh, do any of these models or techniques make use of um, some sort of musical grammar in the assembly stage? So do they check whether the output makes any musical sense? Well, um, for example, the well, what do you mean by grammar in this case? Because I don't know. There, there are some level, there are two levels. I think one is the one is the syntactical one, yeah. which, I mean, for example, you have to fulfill the, the rules of the of music syntax, music notation syntax. Right here, you need to put a bar line and whatsoever. And uh, well, as long as you try to convey all the syntax, uh, you get exceptions to that. So sometimes if you force your model to fit your rules, you probably get some uh, errors because of the violations of the rules. <laughs> so it's it's a bit hard to, to do it by hand, and but it's even harder to do it by grammatical inference because there is no, there is no uh, way of learning such a grammar. I mean there is no no method for learning the kind of language that the using notation is from just from examples. Yeah. But yeah, uh, but for example, in the end-to-end -end approaches, since they are using a recurrent neural network, this this model is implicitly learning this kind of, of things, but it's hard to interpret how well it is doing. Mm -hmm. Or actually, you could test this. Uh, so far, the, the convolutional recurrent networks are non-autoregressive, so the next prediction step only works with the hidden representation of the recurrent layer. You could plausibly feed the output of the previous prediction as another input for the next symbol, and also perhaps for changing the network state. This will make decoding much harder. I guess you could use some uh, machine translation libraries that work like this and then force them to do one more. The inquiry perfect. 
and regarding um, semantical rules or grammar rules in general, um, there's definitely been a lot of work by Bertrand Couillosnon. So he has done actually, I think, trying to describe the music notation both visually but also the rules to encode them as grammars. Um, but these systems have never been, you know, open sourced. So, but I think still, if you're interested in this, you can read um, his his works. I think they've also been referenced here. Otherwise, you you probably find him. Um, so he's been working with grammars. So, so there's an interesting phenomena where. Uh, when the pianist is sight reading, uh, even if there's a wrong note on the page, the pianist will actually unknowingly play the right notes. So that, that says that we, the, 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 the musician, have actually learned the grammar of that particular style, and it, 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 it's like actually amazing. It's, it, it, he, she plays the different note that it's actually written because that was unknowingly wrong note, right? So, I guess eventually uh, we could teach the machine to behave that way. So, one point that hasn't been stressed is that this whole OMR thing isn't the end goal, right? It's just a means to an end which gets us to symbolic data, right? That's, that's the real reason why we're doing this, to get all the symbolic data into the machine so we can use that. So once we have, once we solve the OMR problem, uh, then we'll have lots of symbolic data from which we can learn about music. So that's, that's really the end goal. So once we have lots of data, then we can understand more about music itself. And maybe that will help uh, sort of loop back to the OMR that it, it, it can read as, as musicians read the music score. And in order to understand the scope of this data diversification thing, it's important to realize that only a pretty small fraction of the compositions that have been written has actually been typeset, and an even smaller fraction has been recorded. So written music is still like the major modality through which music is available to people. And if you want to make it available to computers, then like, yeah, please solve OMR with us. <laughs> you have making it available to, to computers just like means to making it available to other humans, yeah. of course. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, I think we'll still yeah. be here around a few more minutes. Um, we hope to be doing next tutorial next year, how we solve all our <laughs> <laughs> five easy steps. <laughs> okay, for so, yeah. so thank you very much for attending. There will be some warmth here for you to take away now. And have a great evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>